Hey guys, uh, Woodruff here. So um, this is another long lecture. This is a long lecture over, you know, general neurological disorders that you might see in a med surge patient. So that's going to include things like tetanus. I'm going to do a real brief overview of increased ICP, um, kind of like general, what's the difference between level of consciousness and orientation. So like a general neuro assessment and um, then headaches. So that's going to be what mostly this covers. I'll have a separate lecture lecture just for stroke patients since that's a bigger topic. Um, but yeah, let's dive in. Oh, and as a reminder, in case you're new and this is the first video you're watching, um, I have shorter, more simpler videos over these topics that kind of break them down um, in a basic way. So if you're looking for something simpler, there's um, other videos on my channel you can check out. You can go under playlist and then unit three um, videos for med surge. All right. So um, first, let's talk about tetanus. So tetanus is a infectious process. Um, you may, you know, we hear a lot about tetanus. We get tetanus shots and stuff like that, but you may have never seen it. It's not very common since the vaccine has come out. Um, it's not something that we see very often unless someone's not vaccinated, et cetera. Um, or doesn't keep up with their vaccinations. But um, for those that do get it, it is um, it is a bacteria and it's usually found in soil places, like places like where there's soil, like so people that are gardeners who work out in the garden would be higher risk for it. Um, uh, in mold, manure, um, uh, you know, people that are, you know, around stuff that could be dirty or contaminated like IV drugs. Uh, drug users and things like that, those that um, are using uh, needles or injecting uh, needles in their arms that could be dirty. Um, you hear a lot of, you think tetanus, you think of like dog bites, things like that. Um, most of the time, like the hallmark or that one that you're always thinking about is like someone stepped, stepping on a rusty nail. So usually like the two components are like your skin is broken by something that's dirty, um, you know, whether that's nail, dog bite, needle, um, but there's other things too. So anyone who um, has broken skin from an injury, like a burn or a frostbite would also be at risk for tetanus. Um, those that have open fractures, so that would be someone who got in a car accident and then they have a bone literally protruding through their skin um, and that um, uh, what do you call it that puts them at risk for tetanus because like a lot of times you're in a car accident um, you get project uh, uh, like thrown out of the car and you end up in like the side of the road or in some dirt and it could get into your body um, and gunshot wounds too are considered kind of dirty wounds um, so um you know, a lot of these patients, when they come in, even if we're, you know, we're not sure if the patient has tetanus, we do evaluate their tetanus status. So that's why also, if you're sitting there, like, why do I have to learn this? Like, what's the key here? The key to learn this is, is because, um, you know, there's a lot of patients that are going to be at risk for this. And so we want to make sure that they're up to date and that they're current with their tetanus um, prophylaxis so that they do not get tetanus because it's a very serious thing. Because um, getting into this, like, what does tetanus look like when tetanus sets in? Um, there's going to be signs of stiffness and rigidity because um, that's it's a neurological, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, infection and things like that. Um, so they have a lot of like neck stiffness um, and um, uh, there's a lot of concern around the airway too when it comes to stiffness and rigidity. Um, and then there's also... Uh, signs of infection. Um, and uh, by the way, I should say the stiffness and rigidity, I mean, it can be throughout the entire body, but um, you know, like there's uh, in general, the patient gets very stiff and rigid. Um, it's very painful. And then they also of course have signs of infection because it is a bacterial infection. Um, but because of all of this, it can also lead to spasm or closure of the airway. And like I said, it's super, super painful. Um, so what do we do? So first and foremost, we always think our ABC. So first, um, we're going to monitor their airway. The patient may need to be on a ventilator because of that risk for their airway closing or they can't protect their airway. So they may need to be on a ventilator. Uh, we also, of course, need to manage the infection. We always have to treat the cause. So most people probably think like, oh, managing the infection is going to be pretty like lower on the list, but it's actually really top of the list. If like, you know, if we're not keeping things clean, like doing thorough wound care and then getting ahead of that infection, um, it can really overwhelm the body and lead to some life or death consequences. So they're going to usually, um, if they have active tetanus, um, we're going to do thorough wound care. We're going to give antibiotics. Um, and then we're going to look at their vaccination, like I brought up, and I'll talk about that on the next 
slide, but effectively, if they hadn't received, uh, if they haven't received a booster, um, like in the last five years, and they have a really dirty wound, we're usually going to give them a booster. Um, but if they're not immunized, or we have like no record, or we don't know, um, and they have, um, uh, you know, a, like a really nasty looking wound, it looks pretty severe, and we have no idea they've never been immunized, um, we give them what's called TIG. And what TIG is, is the tetanus immunoglobulin. And the way that I look at this, like a booster shot is going to help my body to prepare to fight tetanus. So it's like more prophylactic. And, um, um, it's going to take a couple of weeks for that to work. So if I'm just concerned a patient may have tetanus, the booster is usually a good option. And again, there's actual guidelines. It's not just I'm sitting here saying, hey, yeah, you know, I don't think they have it. <laughs> but what I mean is, is that um, we usually do the booster for people that are at risk, but are not necessarily like showing symptoms like they're fighting it right now. Whereas the TIG we give to people that, um, you know, are really uh, like, you know, really, really high risk, like for having tetanus and or those that are not immunized against it. Um, because what an immunoglobulin does is it actually helps to give you immune support now. Like, you know, the Tdap takes about two weeks to start working where the TIG would be someone who needs it now. They have no protection. Someone that, you know, maybe someone's received a Tdap booster seven years ago. Um, they're going to have at least some bit of protection. Their body at some point has um, had some immunity versus tetanus, whereas someone who's had no immunizations, they're just going, I mean, they're completely vulnerable. So that's why they need something stronger and they need that immunoglobulin TIG. It'll make more sense when I show the um, table on the next slide. Um, then we also want to manage um, their pain and their spasms. So we can use things like muscle relaxers and of course give pain management. Um, and then in general, we prevent tetanus through getting that Tdap and we usually get that every 10 years. So this is the tetanus, uh, tetanus decision tree from the textbook that um, we use. And so pretty much like um, it's based on the how how clean or dirty the wound is and then how long it's been. So pretty much if, if it's unknown or they've had like less than three doses of the vaccine and it's a cleaner or minor wound, we're just going to prevent them. Like if we really think like, hey, this is probably not a big deal, we're just going to give them a booster just to make sure that, you know, nothing happens. But again, if it's really dirty or uh, and we're not sure about if they've ever or we know they haven't ever had the um, Tdap vaccine, then, you know, we're going to usually give them the Tdap plus also the TIG. And remember that immunoglobulin gives them help right now. Um, did I say that right? Hold on a sec. It's been oh, okay. Oh, never mind. I just make sure the way I was reading something. I was just the way I was saying it. So if it's been less than five years since they've gotten their last dose, um, really a lot of times nothing's needed because in, in that five in the five year, uh, the Tdap offers a lot of protection if they received it in the five year in the last five years. I mean, of course, in real life, the doctor's gonna make whatever decision they're gonna make about this. But generally, if it's been, you know, about um if, if they've had something in the last five years, they don't need another booster. Um, if it's been like, you know, five to 10 years, if it's clean or minor, um, you know, uh, there may be no indication for a Tdap, but then if it's like, you know, kind of a dirtier wound or a more severe wound, um, we may give them a booster. If it's been, like I said, like it's been seven years. Um, and then if it's been greater than 10 years, they just need to get another booster shot. Uh, if they've already received one, um, the, the three initial doses. Because um, when it's talking about the three doses there, it's like a three dose um, series uh, to get the Tdap vaccine. So that's kind of considered you have your base protection and then you get a booster every 10 years. Um, so if you're sitting there and you're like thinking, oh my gosh, my professors are going to give me some crazy question. I'm going to have to figure out if a wound is clean or not. Um, just think in general, like if they've had, um, you know, if, if it's been, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we're, like at least I can't speak for professors professors at other schools, but you know, here we're, we're not going to be testing you deep on knowing whether a, a wound, expecting a wound to be clean, dirty, et cetera. It's just really connecting that if someone has some, like, you know, they have an open fracture, they have frostbite, things like that, that they're going to be higher risk for, um, you know, um, tetanus in general. So it's a question I want to ask. So we want you to connect like, Hey, I'm probably going to need to ask about that. Um, so that could be a question we could ask is what is a priority question to ask? And we could ask about that. Um, or, you know, we might just give you a question, hey, it's been eight years, um, you know, since someone's received their booster, um, you know, what are most likely you're going to expect? Or, hey, it's been three years, what are you going to expect? And, you know, it's going to be something more clear cut. So don't get too caught up, um, you know, in the back and forth with this. All right. 
So let's talk about increased ICP. So what's the big deal here? Um, the big deal here is, is that increased ICP, um, your, your skull, your, br your brain is in your skull, which it has a limited ability to stretch. It only has so far that it can stretch. Um, and so if it's only able to stretch so far, because it has a limited components, like there, it literally has this outer shell. It has only so far that it can expand. So the big deal is what happens is when my brain cannot expand out, all it can go is down. And when it goes down, it puts pressure on my brain stem, which controls my breathing function. And this is where we talk about brain death and stuff like that. Um, cause when I put too much pressure on my brain stem, eventually those functions, um, can completely, um, we can, you know, we can end up like I lose all oxygen to my brain. I have no, um, no ability to function process and I lose those basic, um, functions I need to breathe, live, survive. So, um, at least to death. So that's the big concern there. So in order to think about neuro patients or patients that have neurological problems, what you really want to think about is what does the brain need to work well? So some things that are helpful or not helpful for the brain is one you need to consider, it needs not too much stimulation. Um, if, if my brain is working too hard, which you know sometimes in these videos, it may seem like it is, um, it's using all of its energy, like you know it, it's, it's working too hard. So um, a lot of times for these patients, we don't want a lot of stimulation for them. We'll even see, have, you'll see signs on the door for a lot of neuro patients, like please see nurse before entering, um, you know, no stimulation, or they might have something like do not disturb this patient from this and this time at night, etc. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of times the, you might, if you were ever, um, you know, have a family member and the nurse tells you like, hey, you know, try not to interact or bother them too much. They're not trying to hurt your feelings or um, be rude. They're really just trying to recognize that the more stimulation, that means like noise, interaction, stress, anything like that, um, regular or awakenings can um, cause too much stimulation. And for someone who has a brain injury, that can be just too much. Uh, it also needs enough oxygen. Um, oxygen is key in order to getting, uh, you know, getting flow and everything everywhere. So in other words, I could have blood flowing, but if there's no oxygen in it, um, you know, that's, that's my energy and everything that I need to make my cells function the way that they're supposed to and do all these beautiful functions like make these videos and be able to <laughs> sometimes form sentences. Um, it also needs not too much carbon dioxide. So something to know about carbon dioxide, if you didn't know it, it is a um, pretty um, extreme dilator, like a vasodilator. So if I have too much carbon dioxide, if let's say that I had a brain injury, I got hit over the head with something and I'm not breathing a lot of times per minute, I'm going to be concerned because um, if going back to fun acid base and remembering that um, in respiratory disorders um, where I'm not breathing very fast, I'm hypoventilating like alcohol and drug overdose, or like I said, if I got hit over the head, I have a brain injury. Um, I'm taking not many breaths per minute. And ventilation is all about how deep and how many breaths per minute. So if I'm not taking a lot of breaths per minute, or I'm not breathing very deep, like in a brain injury, I can hold on to my carbon dioxide and it can get really high. And that's really dangerous because um, it leads to dilation of my arteries, including in my brain. Now, this might not seem like a bad thing. It's like, oh, dilation, that's good. That's open, right? Um, but dilation is actually not very helpful in our blood vessels. Um, it's only helpful to an extent. If I get so dilated that, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, if I, the, the, the effect that carbon dioxide can have on dilation of the vessel can lead to actually pooling of blood. And so blood is not helpful in my brain if it's pooling in places and it's not flowing to places. So I need so much squeeze in my blood vessels to get blood where it's supposed to go. Um, I don't want it to be too squeezed or I don't want it to be too open. It's, it's, there's a fine balance where somewhere in the middle. So in other words, too much carbon dioxide, I'm worried about that too much dilation. Um, I also need good flow. So when I say good flow, what I'm talking about there is I want to think about what position is um, is my head and neck. And so um, when you think about flow to the brain, you have uh, your two, uh, you have, uh, we call them your two, huh? um, you have um, arteries and veins, obviously, that are helping get blood to my brain. And I have artery, I have veins that are getting blood, draining blood away from, <clears throat> away from my 
um, brain. So we want to think about like anytime I'm doing something that's turning my head or if I'm doing some flexion or something extreme, it's putting pressure or it's literally think of it like a hose. Um, if you kind of twist or turn or kink a hose, it's going to lead to less flow of water out of that hose. So it's the same with my neck. If I'm sitting upright and my neck is neutral, um, it's allowing for good flow. But the second it like, you know, most people when they lay in bed, their head kind of turns like this. So um, when I'm taking care of a neuro patient, sometimes I'll even put like towels and things by their head. Head to kind of keep their head um, forces it to keep it straight um, in order for them to have good flow uh, and allow for better brain flow overall for these patients. Um, and so then we also want to think about if I have swelling in my brain, like I said, if the brain is swelling and starting, um, there's pressure um, where like, you know, pretty much my brain is expanding and there's only so much space that it has to expand to, um, you know, what do we do when anything is swollen? I break my arm, it's in a cast, I elevate it. So it's the same with the brain. Well, we're not going to sit there and put the, you know, the brain on some pillows exactly, but what we're going to do is we're going to elevate the head of the bed. So in other words, um, you know, like a very one of the probably the most key and ones you're going to see a lot if you on test questions and stuff like that when it comes to neuro patients um, for ICP is is that I have um uh, what do you call it? I can really support a neuro patient by making sure that their head of bed is elevated. And usually we like it elevated 30 to 45 degrees. We want it elevated enough that I can decrease some of the swelling that's going on in that in their brain. Um, and then we also want it not elevated too much because something that you might find interesting, or at least I find interesting, you may not. <laughs> so is, is that if, um, if, you're, um, when I am sitting upright, like I am, I'm at 90 degrees. My hips are completely flexed right now at 90 degrees. Um, while this to me is fine because I have no brain injury for a patient that has a brain injury, um, flexed hips actually leads to increased intra-abdominal pressure and increased intra-abdominal pressure leads to more pressure in my brain. So in other words, with these patients, I don't want them sitting at 90 degrees because that's going to create more flexion pressure in their abdomen, which creates more pressure in their brain. So, um, you know, what's the big picture here? I'm kind of going back, like, you know, what, what's the big deal here? The big deal, because I maybe I didn't, I, I kind of talked about, you know, hey, what could happen? What's the worst possible thing? But in ICP is intracranial pressure and too much pressure means not enough flow. Like, you know, because it's it's like kind of, I always think I compare it to compartment syndrome where everything like it's, um, it, there's just compression, like everything's swollen as much as it can. There's no room for um, any more expansion um, through my skull, um, you know, when my brain is swelling because of an injury, tumor whatever is going on. Um, and so what's happening here is, is that all that can do, uh, all that can happen is there's increased pressure on the blood vessels um, and less flow in the brain, which um, doesn't lead to me being able to function well. Um, so I talked through most of these, um, but this is what you want to think. So based on those are the things that I need um, as a patient who has problems with too much pressure in my brain. These are some general interventions uh, you want to think about. I'm pretty sure that um, you know, I've gone over most of these. So I told, talked about the head of bed. You want it elevated 30 to 45 degrees. You want to keep their head neutral, like I said, in alignment. You want to worry about anything that's going to cause agitation or distress. So this is a great time where if you have a family member that's getting in your patient's face, you can sit there and be like, you got to go. <laughs> you know, you, you're you not or, you're not on the orders. <laughs> like, you know, right now you are going against my doctor's order. So you got to go. Um, uh, then also, like I said, if they have a decreased level of consciousness and a lot of neurological patients, they're not as awake as other patients, they can have a decreased respiratory rate, which again, then I retain CO2 and that can cause vasodilation. I think the only one I didn't mention was fevers. So fevers also increase my metabolism and cause my body to work harder. Um, so as a whole, um, when I'm trying to prevent and control fevers, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to decrease the workload. So just like, you know, I love cardiac, just like with the heart, I want to decrease the workload of the heart. So it's not working so hard. Same with the brain. If I'm dealing with an injury in my brain stroke, whatever it might be, um, I do not want them working, um, uh, what do you call it? working so hard and like stressing out with their fever. What I, I want them to be relaxed and resting, et cetera, best as possible. That includes um, not having a fever. Because again, if my body is using all of its energy to manage and decrease that fever, um, it's going to have less oxygen. It's going to have less energy to do really important tasks. 
Um, what I want to say real quick, because I've spent a lot of time on this, and generally when I spend a lot of time on something, it's something super important. But I want to say this is really just an introduction. In adult med search, we do not go over increased ICP as an actual like testable topic. But it like when we talk about an acute stroke patient, this is going to be really pertinent. Now, for a headache patient, I don't need to do all this stuff for a headache patient. They're not having increased intracranial pressure. But anyone who's unconscious, anyone who's had an acute stroke, um, and then has um, you know, some sort of infection in their brain, like really serious um, stuff that can lead to swelling, pressure, any sort of injury to the brain. Um, that's where um, anything that affects oxygen in the brain, this is all the times that these would apply. So I like, I know that it might not apply as much to this PowerPoint. Um, it makes a lot more sense in class when I do them back to back. But um, just so you know, if you're sitting there kind of saying like, why is this ICP thing in here? What, how am I going to apply this? A lot of this stuff, like these interventions I was talking about right here, they mostly apply when I'm talking for this class about stroke patients. Now, when you get to complex, um, you'll, you'll definitely be getting in deeper in this topic and you're going to be, um, you know, learning deep about like actual brain injuries and things like that and how they're related to this. But um, if you don't understand this, it's really hard to understand some of the other stuff we do once we get to talk about stroke next. So hopefully it didn't confuse you too much. <clears throat> So let's talk about care for an unconscious client because we may, um, even on a med surge unit, we can have unconscious clients. So my priority for an unconscious client, because they cannot do this for themselves, is to protect their airway or keep it open. So I'm going to utilize devices, um, positioning them in certain positions, uh, and specifically like a really good one to um, encourage oxygenation and prevent aspiration is going to be sideline. So I like their head of bed elevated, but I turn them sideline. That way, if they're unconscious, and let's say that they vomit for some reason, um, if you vomit and you're laying just straight up, if you vomit, it can easily aspirate down. But if you're turned sideline, it encourages that vomit to go um, out towards the side and less chance of aspiration versus sitting up uh, upright, um, just like in a normal forward position. Um, <clears throat> we might also use oxygen as well to support good oxygenation for these patients. I'm going to watch their mental status closely. We're going to do vital signs. Um, to check, um, you know, make sure that they are stable, since again, they may not be able to tell me if they are, they obviously can't tell me if they're unconscious, um, how things are going. Um, and then also regular repositioning, because we're really, a lot of it's going to be preventing complications of mo immobility. So going along with that, other complications they can have, they can have really poor oral care, um, especially if they're vomiting or, um, you know, if they're not awake and stuff like that, a lot of people can mouth breathe and it can lead to like um, higher chance of bacteria in the mouth. So I like to have suction equipment at the bedside, regularly doing oral care. I also provide, um, uh, I'm acting like I'm talking about me. We also provide <laughs> um, nutrition. So um, if this patient's going to be unconscious, especially for a prolonged period of time, even if it's a short period of time, we don't want to leave them without nutrition. Nutrition is so helpful for um, uh, muscle strength, muscle um, health. And like, I'm talking about you know, like your respiratory muscles to be able to breathe and support yourself. Um, a lot of people that are unconscious, maybe they have infections, something else going on. So we want to provide stuff that's going to help um, to support them as they're recovering. And we don't want to wait too, too long for that. So the enteral would be giving the food um, in through like an NG or an OG something, you know, um, into their GI system where parenteral would be IV um, nutrition if the, um, the oral um, uh, feeding is not appropriate. We also want to protect their skin and their mucous membranes because they cannot protect them themselves. Sometimes we have to pad this patient's skin, um, regular skin checks, regular repositioning. And then if they're, they're obviously not able to do their own range of motion, so I would be helping them with that. So that's like, you know, when I go in and turn, I'll just kind of um, move my patient's joints, um, you know, especially a lot of their major joints just to keep them um, from getting contractures. And then I want to provide general emotional support for the family during this time. So let's get into some of the fun nitty gritty when it's talking about neuro, um, <clears throat> uh, neuro assessment and some of the things that are going to be so key as uh, you're jumping into a neuro patient. So first we want to talk about level of consciousness versus orientation, and you know, really like what's the difference here and how do we measure each? Um, because um, a lot of times students get these mixed up because, you know, most people say alert and oriented times four or whatever. Um, so it seems like it's talking about one thing, but these are two separate things. The alert part is the level of consciousness and the times four, uh, the, the oriented times four is a completely separate thing. 
Um, now they go, they're a lot of times incorporated together because they do go hand in hand because most people that are alert are hopefully also oriented. But, um, you know, there definitely is a spectrum here. And it's good just to know because if a doctor said, asked you, how's their orientation, it's a very different question than if a doctor asked you, how's their level of consciousness? So first let's talk about what orientation is. <clears throat> so the, um, uh, Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I was sitting here. I was like, what did I write here? So yeah, sometimes I write stuff and I'm like, wait, what are you writing here, girl? Um, so the alert in A and O times four is talking about level of consciousness. So it's not talking about orientation. Um, but the times four, the, the oriented times four is that's the part that's talking about orientation and the four parts of orientation that most people um, utilize is they're oriented to person. So you want to know the questions that are connected to these, because I can sit there and know that, hey, are they oriented to person? But what does that mean? What do I need to ask? So in order to check <clears throat> orientation to person, I'm going to ask the person, um, can you tell me your name and date of birth? I'm also going to see if they're oriented to place. Um, and so most people are like, hey, um, I've even heard people say, hey, do you know you're in the hospital? And the person will be like, yes. <laughs> so like, that's not the way we're really supposed to ask. You're supposed to say, hey, where are you? Um, and if they say the hospital, cool, that's great. But I also like to know what city, because I've had people be like, oh yeah, I'm in Abilene. I'm in some other city, like very, very far away, El Paso, et cetera. And so you want to know, do they know generally where they are? Um, you also want to check orientation to time. And so some people will expect people to know the day of the week, the date. I mean, hell, I don't even know that. So um, I usually just want them to know, can they tell me what month it is? Or if there's been a holiday um, recently, I'll say like, hey, what holiday um, just happened? And then situation, can they tell you why they're in the hospital? They don't need to tell me, hey, you know, I have a mechanical valve, blah, 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 blah whatever. Um, but can they tell me, hey, I got a heart problem. Hey, I'm here because of infection. Hey, I'm here because um, I was, I fell down. I feel loopy, whatever happened. Um, but I just want to, those are the kind of the basics for orientation and how um, my expectations, because I always try to keep it reasonable, um, especially in relation to their injury. So then on the other hand, and I don't, um, you know, orientation is super important, but when it comes to like life or death changes in what you like as a nurse and especially in nursing school, if you want to learn something super important, it's level of consciousness. Um, this is telling how awake a patient is. And it's so important because, um, like I have here at the bottom, when there's changes going on in the brain, so for a neuro patient, and this also goes for other things, when there's infection, um, when you have diabetes issues, I mean, we've been through this the whole semester, that when there are changes in the brain, usually the first sign is a change in level of consciousness. I don't think there's any situation where there's a change in level of consciousness, and it's okay, aside from if you're receiving a med that's going to affect your level of consciousness, but you still got to monitor it. Um, so, um, effectively level of consciousness is how awake the patient is. So when I, when a doctor asks me, Hey, how, what's their level of consciousness? I'm telling them how much stimulation does it take? Or what do I have to do to get this patient to wake up? Um, you know, do I go into the room and they're already awake? Are they um, answering my questions? Are they making sense when they're answering my questions? What can they do motor and sensory wise, things like that. Um, so like this is the basic um, level of consciousness um, assessment that we do. And, and generally in the hospital, what you're going to see, regardless of where you work, you're going, and, I mean, even regardless of whether you're working with adults, children, you know, I was going to say dogs, but you know, obviously I need to get some sleep. <laughs> um, I'm, I don't think I'm training anyone to become a dog nurse, but um, yeah, I mean, who knows? Um, but um, as a whole, the general scale that's used widely among many people, uh, many hospitals, in most healthcare systems, what's known as the GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, so it has three different categories, eyes, verbal, and motor, and I'm going to kind of take you through each of these. So first, the first part of the GCS or the Glasgow Coma Scale to see how awake someone is, is I'm going to see how, how what is their best response with their eyes. Um, so the highest that they can have is a four and the lowest they can have is a one. So like I said, there's three categories and the lowest score for all of them is a one in all categories. So just know a GCS can never be zero. Um, the lowest a GCS can be is three and the highest it can be is 15. So pretty much I'm scoring a patient in all of these things. So and you can see the scale here. So first I look and see how much stimulation does it take um, for me to get them to open their eyes. If I go into the room and the patient's eyes open right there, they turn and look at me, they can open their eyes spontaneously. Um, if I go into the room, I'm, you know, in there, I, you know, and um, 
uh, you know, I walk in and they are not able just on their own or and again, sometimes people are sleeping. This is not saying, hey, are people asleep? Because sometimes, you know, students find it confusing. They'll go into a room. They'll be like, well, my patient was sleeping. So I rated them a three. Well, I mean, that that's not really necessarily what they are. Can can regularly they are do they have their eyes open regularly at any point can, uh, during your you know assessment? Were they able to open their eyes spontaneously and respond to you? Um, or was it more like I always think about how much I have to do to wake them up. So if I go into a patient's room and I'm walking around and stuff like that, they're not waking up. But then I say, hey, Mr. John, and then they turn and look at me. Um, that's what a three would be. They open their eyes to voice. Now, if I go in, I'm talking to them. Hey, Mr. John, there's no response. Then I'll usually start with like a light tapping on their shoulder. Hey, Mr. John, um, you know, can you wake up? Um, can you hear me? And, you know, if they open their eyes to like a touch or a, some sort of stimulus, then usually we rate them a two. And like I said, I always start with least invasive first. So I try like a shoulder tap. I'll try a little pinch on their arm. I try to stay away from pushing on the nails, especially because there's so many diabetics and we can hurt nails. Um, but I'll, um, if I have to, I'll do like a more central stimulus, like a sternal rub. Um, you can um, you can squeeze here. Um, uh, by the clavicle and um, it's a trapezius pinch where you're um, pinching up here. It hurts really bad. And you can also, you can find there's this little notch above your eye uh, on your eyebrow um, on the supraorbital notch and put pressure. It hurts like heck. Um, so those ones do not do those first. Those are the ones we do if they're not responding to everything else. If I'm pinching them, if, if I'm like tapping them, if I'm, um, you know, trying to wake them up and they're not responding to that, I want to see, can they respond to any pain? Because maybe they're just really, really sedated or something else. I don't know. But, um, you know, it does, it's, it's not about the why. It's just seeing what is it going to take. And then if no matter what stimuli you do, if I do like those like trapezius pinch, if I'm doing the super orbital notch pressure, if I'm doing a sternal rub and they're not waking up, I would score them a one. Next is verbal. So the highest you can have in verbal is a five. And again, the lowest you can have is a one. For this one, I'm seeing what's their best verbal response. So if they're oriented, like they're able to say, yes, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm here. Blah, blah, blah. You know, they answer everything um, and they're oriented. They get a five. If they answer my questions, but they don't answer them correctly, then they would get a four. So if they're maybe disoriented by one, two, it doesn't matter how much. If they're disoriented at all, they get confused. Um, <coughs> if they're only saying words, which means like they're only saying a couple words at a time, like I'm like, what's your name? And they're um, they're just kind of like, um, you know, me, I don't know, or like, um, like just kind of no, yeah, like they're just they're saying words, but they don't make sense together. Hungry, I me, you know, like they're just saying kind of words that, that don't really um, um, make sense together. They're not usually um, saying stuff that um, goes together. Then we'll give them a three, which is words. They can still say words, but they're not words that go together. So if I asked them like, hey, what's your name? They, they're not answering my question. They're just, all they can give me is like one or two words. Um, I would give them a two if all they're doing is sound. So if I'm like, hey, what's your name? And they're like, oh, mm. like, you know, like a lot of times these patients, their eyes are closed. I'm not saying they always are, but a lot of times their eyes are closed and they're just making noises or grunting. There's no words. It's just sounds. And then a one is they don't have any verbal response. Um, the last part is motor, and this is probably the most confusing one. It's a little bit harder and it takes some practice and stuff like that and having to see some of these others. Um, but the highest they can have is a six. And if you'll notice with eyes, um, verbal and motor, it goes in order. So highest for eyes is four, highest for verbal is five and highest for motor is six. So if you have trouble remembering numbers, um, you know, the, the most you can get again is 15. Um, and the lowest score you can have for um, the whole GCS is gonna be a three, um, you know, cause you can score a, one is the lowest in all the categories. So um, if you're ever having trouble remembering, you know, if you're trying to score someone or think about it, think, you know, Eyes, um, verbal motor, it goes four, five, six is the highest. And that always helps me remember it. Um, so for this one, um, the best that they, if the, um, the motor response is seeing how um, their, their physical response, how they're able to um, respond when you ask them to do something. So um, for these, I like to ask them to give a thumbs up or raise their eyebrows. Some people will do hand squeeze, um, but there is um, reflexes in your hand that if you stick your fingers in people's hands, even if they have a lower brain function, that sometimes they may squeeze their hand, but they're not actually hearing what you're saying. So I like to do things that I can succinctly say they had to have heard me and processed it in their brain in order to do this. So thumbs up is something that takes, it's not something that you could accidentally do. Raise eyebrows, same thing. Um, 
<coughs> the next one's what's called localizing. Um, so for this, this would be if the patient's not able to follow commands, but let's say I'm brushing the patient's teeth, localizing would be them pushing me away. They are pushing away whatever I'm doing. Or if I pinch their arm, they would be pushing my hand away. So they're not pulling away, they're pushing whatever's bothering them away. So if I'm pinching them, they're pushing my hand away. If I'm brushing their teeth, they're pushing my hand away where I'm brushing their teeth. Whereas um, that's a five. Um, withdrawals is the opposite, where if I was um, if I was brushing their teeth, it's kind of they're pulling away, or if I was pinching them, they're pulling, it's like, a, it's usually a very rapid, fast pulling away from whatever a stimulus is. So um, remember how I said, like when we're checking, um, you know, eyes and like, I'm trying, I'm going to try to do like, start with the least invasive stimulus and build up to something else. Um, so if I was doing like the pinch on their arm, that would be an example of one. So in other words, to test this, um, you have to have some sort of stimulus. So if they don't, if they're not awake and following commands, then you have to start applying, um, you know, a painful or other stimulus and you kind of see how they respond to that. Um, after withdrawals, then we start to get into some that are like lower level of functioning. Now, these are basic reflexes. So this may seem like they're doing something, but these are, um, you know, brain, brain um, reflexes. They're usually a sign of very poor neurological functioning. Um, so first is what's known as the corticate posturing. And so with the corticate posturing, you know, let's say I pinch or do something on someone's um, arm. What happens, I always remember to corticate, they're um, going in towards their core. They're still protecting themselves. So usually what happens is this patient their arms, they come in and they slowly curl up like this, um, but they can't stay extended and then just curl in. It's about, always about that inward movement. Um, and so um, that's uh, number three, where does cerebral posturing, same thing, I pinch their arm or provide some, um, have some sort of pressure or pain. And what that leads to is a reflex where, remember, decorticate, I'm in here towards my body, does cerebral um, I'm pushing out. So to Sarah Britt, I'm not protecting my core anymore. Um, you give the stimulus and their arms turn out. Now you're probably gonna have to look at pictures of that because otherwise me sitting there and saying this, you're like, what in the world? But until you've seen neuro patients, this is what happens. So um, decorticate is a slow curling um, um, towards in towards my core where to Sarah Britt is a slow um, uh, what do you call it? Um, turning out away from my body. Um, and that one's worse. Um, it's usually a sign of even lower neurological functioning. And then one would be, you're doing all the painful stimulus. You're doing the stern, unlike the other ones, if you're not pinching the skin, you can do the sternal rub or that, um, trapezius pinch or that super orbital notch. And that's what you're seeing their response to. So what are the key principles? You want to score them on the best they can do. So if there's one eye or arm that's doing one response and the other is doing another, you want to score what the best is, um, even if one is a lot weaker than the other. Um, you always want to use the least invasive stimulus first before doing anything aggressive. Like I said, gentle tap touch, then pinch or sharp pressure. Then you do the central um, um, stimulus like the sternal rubber trapezius pinch. Um, you always want to see, um, score what you see. So the person before you, maybe, uh, you know, um, they had something different. Don't trust your gut with this when you're seeing things. You, I, sometimes I'm sitting there, I'm like, hey, what are you seeing with this? And I'll, I'll kind of, you know, have someone else come in because um, sometimes these little changes are subtle um, and they change. So you always want to um, be reporting these changes. Um, so I, that's the last slide for GCS, but I would just say, just remember overall, maximum score 15, um, lowest is three. Um, and you just want to make Make sure that um, as you're doing this, that um, you're scoring the best that they can do in each of these categories based on your own um, evaluation. You do want to keep consistency with how you're doing the, um, the testing and stuff like that. So a lot of times if I have a neuro patient, um, you know, when I say, hey, like, what are they doing? Are they waking up? You know, whatever it might be. Um, I'll ask the nurse to kind of like tell me or show me what they've been doing to get stimulus out of the patient. All right. So those were really serious topics. Now we're gonna move into something lighter and fluffy, which is not light and fluffy if you have them, um, but we're gonna transition a little bit into a more um, basic topic that you are gonna see. Now, patients generally are not admitted to the hospital for headaches, but you're gonna have a lot of patients that could have headaches, have a history of headaches. Um, so it's definitely something you want to be familiar with. 
Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about um, first headaches. What are they? Like, what's the big so what? So a headache, and this might seem very counterintuitive to what you think it is, a headache is actually a vasodilation of blood vessels in the surface of the brain. Now, most people think it's a constriction because it's painful. It feels like it has to be constrictive, but it's actually a vasodilation. It's that pooling of blood um, that, um, that leads to the pain. Now, um, this is very important to know because, um, the treatments, if I'm vasodilating, what do you think the treatments might be? Hmm, hmm. So, um, here's just some example. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Here's, um, the three types of headaches we're going to cover. We're going to talk about tension headaches. We're going to talk about migraines and cluster. And when you're studying these, what you want to do is you want to study, um, not only just, um, like what the differences are when it comes to like severity and stuff like that. But the re like, um, it's really important as you're studying not to look at, they're all going to be pain. They're all going to be somewhere in the head region, but what makes the symptoms different and what treatments are different. So you can kind of look at tension, migraine, and cluster. This is kind of an order from least severe tension. And I, I know sometimes if y'all have tension headaches, don't come for me because I know that sometimes they can be worse um, than what I'm saying here. But what I mean is, is generally compared to others, tension are seen as the more minor headaches, um, whereas cluster are seen to be the most severe headaches. Um, so tension is kind of the least and migraines are kind of a moderate um, pain and clusters are their severe pain. So what you really want to do as we're studying these is look at what are the differences here um, in how this patient is going to present, where their pain is, because um, a lot of times where their pain is is going to um, navigate treatment. And then also what's the difference or the progression of what I'm doing for treatment for these. So first, let's talk about tension headaches. So tension headaches generally feel, um, it literally, most people can um, uh, complain of like a band-like pain or they feel like their head is being squeezed. Um, they can have um, sensitivity to light, but usually there's not going to be any like GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting. You are going to see that with others. Um, there's no aura in this one. It's just kind of like a tense, um, a tense pain, like again, like you're wearing a headband. Um, there also can be some um, neck involvement. You can see like here with this, it can go all the way down the neck as a result. And it's kind of like the name suggests, it's tension. So it can cause tension in the neck. And so um, when it says increased resistance to passive movement, so that's like if I'm trying to move um, or if someone's trying to push my head back, if I had a tension headache, um, it would be um, it would be harder for me to move. It's almost like it's stiff or like literally like I don't I want to keep saying tense, but that's the best word I could come up with. Um, it's like a stiffness or rigidity almost. And remember, we're always worried about rigidity in the neck, so it's not exactly that. I don't really like to say that, but it's just it's a little bit harder to move the neck back, and a lot of that there's a lot of pain or neck tenderness as a whole. Um, so with these, um, we're going to treat the symptoms and usually we start with least invasive first. A lot of times tension headaches, you give them some Tylenol, some uh, uh, acetaminophen, um, aspirin or NSAIDs, those are going to be enough, but keep in mind, these are also tension related or there's that neck tension. So this is going to be the only type of headache that we usually use muscle relaxers for. Um, and so, because we're trying to help to relax that muscle in the neck, it's going to relieve some of their pain. Um, they're also, so those are all to acutely treat the symptoms right now. Um, we also want to prevent these headaches. These headaches can be prevented. There's lots of ways to prevent headaches. We'll talk about them. Um, but medication wise, we use things like antidepressants, like SSRIs, um, TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants can be used. You do not have to know these in depth, um, but just know in general that these are some of the ways that we prevent them. Anti-seizure drugs can be used. Um, as well, um, like, you know, like we use, um, we use a variety of them. I'll talk about, um, some more of them, but like, you know, for some things and also in migraines and stuff, we use things like topiramate, um, things like that. And then we also use, um, beta blockers as well. And you're going to see this, uh, a, a lot. And there's a lot of the blood pressure meds that are used for headaches. Uh, it might not make sense because I, I know you're thinking like, hey, I thought you said that this was a vasodilation. Wouldn't things that relax the blood vessels make things worse? And it's not completely understood how it helps, um, how all of these medications help. But all of them seem to help, um, uh, what do you call it, to um, relieve some of the, the symptoms that this patient's having and also prevent them from having a tendency of um, having these headaches in the future. So education we're going to do for these patients. 
Um, we want to do good mitigation teaching. So if they're on acetaminophen, you know, we're always worried about with Tylenol, the risk that their liver could get hurt. We do not want them to take more than the recommended dose. You're only allowed to have so much acetaminophen in 24 hours. And we also don't want them drinking alcohol um, because uh, at the same time that they're taking that because it can exacerbate their liver failure um, or liver, uh, I don't want to say liver failure, but liver problems. Um, then aspirin and insets, we're going to be concerned that the patient can bleed as a result of this. So um, we always want to um, kind of keep that in mind that we're worried about bleeding, especially GI bleeding, um, ulcers and stuff in their stomach. So we're going to be watching that, make sure to tell them to take that with food. Um, because there's tension in the neck on top of the muscle relaxers, we can also do things like do massage, we can do um, like uh, moist hot packs on the neck are super, super helpful. And that can be to the back of the neck, we can also do them to the forehead. Um, and then there's other alternative therapies, and you're going to see this for all of them. So a lot of times tension headaches are related to stress. So things like counseling, things like quitting nursing school, just kidding. Um, uh, we can also teach them muscle relaxation that can do things like massage and stuff can help as well. Acupuncture, acupressure, yoga, biofeedback, um, hypnosis, things like that too. <clears throat> so how about migraines? So we talked about tension headaches, the band-like pain. Migraines are unilateral, which means one-sided throbbing pain. It's usually on a temple. So it's either going to be on this side or on this side in my temple area. My temple area is right here. Um, and so... Um, uh, the, the things that come with a migraine, there's none of that neck tension like we have with tension headaches. And um, what we're going to have is sensitivity to light noises and odors. They can have some GI symptoms, general irritability. Um, and one of the most telling things that is different with a migraine is going to be an aura. In other words, um, an aura is kind of like, uh, and you can have auras before seizures, you can have auras before migraines, but it's pretty much your body saying you're about to have a, a migraine. Um, and this shows up as um, some sort of either visual disturbance. They can have an auditory or like something they hear that's a disturbance. They can see, have strange smells, but it's something that happens. This is an example of what someone might see if they were having an aura. Um, so they can have patchy blindness, bright lights, visual distortions, zigzag lines. They can smell something strange. They can hear some strange noise or something right before it happens. Um, migraines can are also associated with a lot of triggers. So some triggers for migraines are going to be things like certain foods, um, it being that time of month for women, um, physical exertion, fatigue, and stress um, are going to be a big part of, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, are going to be a big part of uh like a trigger and stuff for migraines. And so those things, when those factors get worse, um, hunger, but you can see like, I mean, it's just about anything. And that's the hard thing with um, uh, headaches is it's like, it's like, well, what's the trigger? And I mean, you can keep diaries and stuff like that. And yes, it is a nursing intervention to tell them to keep a diary. Um, but it's kind of just like, think of it like allergic rhinitis. Like, you know, sometimes it's hard. There's sometimes a lot of things that can trigger this, but it is good for them to kind of keep track. When do these happen? What's happening right before? Um, so now we're going to get into a key med. And so like this, when I say something's a first line treatment, generally we do not care that, um, you know, first line, second line, whatever. But I, I will tell you, if you want to know a, a headache medication, this is one you're going to want to know because it's used. It's one of the most common medications used. It's a class known as serotonin receptor agonist. I have another slide talking just about it. So, but this is our first line treatment. We can also use aspirin and NSAIDs, but a lot of times they're just generally, um, they, we, we will use those too. Um, but most these patients, that's not going to be enough. They need something um, like an SRA that's going to be stronger. Um, <clears throat> and we use a lot of the same stuff for prevention, except um, a lot of times with migraine, not a lot of times, but sometimes with migraines, we'll use stuff like Botox, um, which can help to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, cause pr uh, prevention where they're not having as many problems with that vasodilation. Um, so Botox, it's used to prevent, it's not used to acutely treat like an acute migraine. They give multiple inject injections around the head and the neck into the pain fibers. Um, it can take up to six months to see maximum effects. So in the meantime, they need to take out their other medicines and then they get injections every, um, every three months. So pretty much it freezes the pain fibers. Um, so when I was, I know I was saying it kind of, it helps with the vasodilation, but it like um, Botox itself more helps where you're not going to necessarily experience as much of the pain, even if there is stuff going on with your vessels when I say that, but like the research that I read 
talked about multiple ways that it could help. It really just depends, but don't get too deep into the patho here. We're not going to ask you deep about the patho for Botox, but just understand that it's preventative. It can take some time. So they can't just be like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to get my Botox and I'm going to go off my meds. They're probably going to need to continue their meds for a while. Let's talk about this key med, this first line known as SRAs or serotonin receptor agonists. All these medications end in tryptan. So when I, we talk about the tryptans, these are our serotonin receptor agonists. Um, pretty much what they do, because remember, this is when I said, hey, it's probably important to know that um, uh, headaches are really just a massive vasodilation because one of our primary treatments here is going to be a vasoconstrictor. Um, so pretty much SRAs um, vasoconstrict, which decreases that pain. So this uh, the med you probably know the most is um, Imitrex. It can be given oral, it can be given sub-Q, nasal spray, or transdermal. And it's given these ways because a lot of times when people come in, they're having GI symptoms with this. So we need alternative ways where someone doesn't have to swallow a pill, et cetera. Um, the thing to keep in mind is, is that it's great if this stops a headache, but if what this medicine is doing is vasoconstricting or squeezing my blood vessels, this is not going to be safe for anyone who has a history of blood vessel problems, like someone who has a history of high blood pressure, stroke, um, things like that, other cardiovascular disease. Um, overall, um, it's going to, it can make you kind of drowsy, dizzy, um, uh, what do you call them? So you definitely want to um, be cautious with that and be watching out for severe vasoconstriction in these patients. Um, general migraine education, we want to tell them to take their medications early, especially, but like while they're having their aura or when their migraine first begins, because the earlier the treatment, the better the outcome for them or less the pain or the less long lasting it might be. Um, preventative treatment is super important. Um, when they're having a migraine, it's um, a lot of times since they're so sensitive to light and things like that, it'll help to um, for them to go to a quiet, um, um, you know, low light environment. If the migraines persist, we may consider Botox or more invasive therapies. And then we have a lot of the same therapies, like I mentioned, for tension, where we're going to do things to relax them, things to um, alter and change kind of the um, the way that their body is responding, maybe to stress and other things like that. So last but not least, there's cluster headaches. Now, these are the most severe. Um, so like when people describe them, they'll say they're sharp, penetrating, or burning. And they can the, they may seem like they're not as my uh, they're more minor because they only last for a few minutes and they can last up to three hours and they can occur up to eight times per day. So it may seem like, oh, you know, like that doesn't seem as bad, but they're more they can be more frequent. And it's kind of like I almost think of it like an autoimmune. There's like exacerbations and remissions that commonly occur more at night. But the problem with these is that they um they're not like, you know, we talked about before, um, there's, you know, the bands like pain for tension, there's um, temp, like one-sided temporal pain for migraines, for cluster headaches, it's one-sided, usually eye swelling, there's facial flush, flushing, tearing, um, constriction of the pupil. Um, and so it's a lot of stuff around the eye. And so this is where um, sometimes this can be confused with seasonal allergy. So a lot of people don't catch it, but you want to think it's everything around the eye and almost like allergy symptoms. So um, we treat these pa patients with the SRAs. And again, these patients, I mean, it is severe. So usually they're going to need stuff like the nasal spray or something that's going to work right now. But an interesting treatment you might find, and this can be used for others, but when we think about like what it's no what's normally ordered, um, you're going to see it mostly just for cluster headache is what's known as what, what's known as, like, you don't know what this is. <laughs> um, just kidding. Um, but um, what can be given to is oxygen. You may be wondering what in the heck? Um, and if it's given oxygen, we're giving 100% via mask. Um, but what you have to think about here with cluster headaches is the reason O2 is an answer here is remember, what's the problem in headaches? Vasodilation. And if you back up and you think about what I talked about earlier, remember I said, if you have too much CO2, you're vasodilated. When I talked in the beginning of this PowerPoint about... Um, uh, things that help the brain. So if CO2 and O2 work opposite and CO2 is a vasodilator, what do you think O2 does? If you said constricts, you are correct. So O2 is a vasoconstrictor. Um, so if I'm giving 100% via mass, this can help um, very quickly decrease some pain and decrease some of the symptoms uh, or some, some of the um, problem in a cluster headache. Um, Long-term, we use a lot of the same stuff um, for prevention, um, just adding in alpha blockers, calcium channel blockers, which I'll talk about on the next slide. We can also use steroids and stuff like that. And some people have to have like steroid injections and stuff.
So calcium channel blockers. Um, so, you know, most people think calcium channel blockers, they think vasodilation. Um, but the way that it works, it affects the vessel wall, which um, the way that these work specifically for, for headaches in the, in, the, in the vessels in the brain is they affect the vessel walls leading to less relaxation. Um, and so it also reduces calcium movement, which can help to, um, you know, it helps sometimes with kind of like almost because a lot of times calcium channel blockers, we use them for spasm and stuff like that. But again, don't go too deep into the how actually do they help? Because I get this every semester. How do these medications help? I mean, I have researched, I've looked and like I see, well, maybe this, maybe that it's not well understood. Um, but just keep in mind, um, you know, these are some things that are used. Um, and they're for prevent, like the, a lot of all the like beta alpha calcium channel blockers, all we'll call them our ABCs. Um, they're all used for prevention. So like usually if we're going to use a calcium channel blocker for cluster headaches, it'll be something like verapamil. Um, so what teaching do we do for cluster headaches? We, um, we usually, like I said, we do like sub Q or nasal spray triptans, like the sumatriptan, um, which is the SRAs. And because remember, we need something quick now. And a lot of them are not going to, are going to be sick at their stomach, not going to tolerate, um, you know, trying to take something orally. We want to teach them safe oxygen use at home. Definitely no smoking while they're um, doing that, but how to change off and to change out their tank, you know, how to keep st safe storage, that kind of stuff. Um, prevention, we can use the high dose for Apamil. And then there's other things like nerve blocks, um, deep brain stimulation, there's ablations. That's where we burn off pathways. Like if something's happening, that's leading your brain, um, you know, signals in your brain to lead to this vasodilation that can try to, um, map it out and stop that. And then things like, uh, biofeedback. Now these are very deep stuff. You don't have to know in depth about these, but just know there's different ways that we can block the pain, um, block, uh, maybe kind of get to the root of the cause of these headaches. Overall, for patients with headaches, we want to encourage them to keep a headache diary. Um, like I said, kind of keep their triggers um, and keep an eye, um, keep an eye on what their triggers are. And then, of course, once they learn them, try to avoid them. General stress management for these patients, try um, because stress is so closely related to headaches. So I know all of you guys have probably had more headaches in nursing school than any other time. Um, we want to provide um, good dietary counseling for um, foods like that are um, triggers for headaches. And of course, all the um, foods that are headache triggers are the most delicious foods. So chocolate, cheese, tomatoes, oranges, red wine, things like that are also going to be um, common food triggers. So that's the first part of neuro. So I'm breaking this up into two parts. So this is just general neurological disorders, ICP, tetanus, headaches, all the fun stuff, level of consciousness orientation. I know it was a lot and it was kind of a hodgepodge all over the place, but hopefully this got you set up to get started to learn about neuro. Neuro is okay. It's not as cool as cardiac, but it's better than some other stuff. So got to take what you can get. See you next time.